This is Dr. Ray Henry. Welcome to the Moment of Destiny broadcast. Today's topic is revival. Some have defined revival as a reviving of dead areas of our Christian life. Others have said revival is a new discovery of Jesus. The little book of Habakkuk tells us of three elements that are found in every real revival. Listen closely so you can experience revival. I want to thank many of you for telling me that you're watching our program, Moment of Destiny. You have told me how much this program means to you week after week. But at this time, we need your help more than ever. For a love gift of $50, we're going to send you our prayer journal, Walking in Victory Journal. It has sections on how to do a quiet time, how to study the Bible. It has a section on basic Christianity, how to renew your mind every day and live the Christian life. It has a section on how to pray for other people. When you send your love gift to P.O. Box 15545, West Palm Beach, Florida, 33416, we will send you the Walking in Victory Journal. We want to look today, if you would, to the third chapter of Habakkuk. Third chapter of Habakkuk. And we're going to look at those first two verses. And it deals with revival. Now, most people in South Florida typically do not know what revival is all about. We're going to give you a couple of definitions of what revival is. And Habakkuk is asking God to revive his beloved country of Judah in the midst of years. To bring about a revival, a restoration of that land. And uh, some people really don't want revival. Are we willing to ask what Habakkuk asked, asking God to revive his work in their life? Look, if you would, Habakkuk, the third chapter, verse one and two. A prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet, upon Shiganoth, that's a musical instrument. O Lord, I have heard thy speech and was afraid. O Lord, revive thy work. In the midst of the years, in the midst of the years, make known. In wrath, remember mercy. And boy, that last phrase we need to remember here in America. In wrath, in your judgment, please be merciful. Remember mercy. Amen. Amen. He's going to judge sin. He's going to judge his people. He's going to judge a nation. But we can ask God, as you judge us and judge our nation, please Please be merciful. Amen? Amen. What a prayer that all of us need to pray. Just take that phrase with you, write it down on something, and just pray it all week. In wrath, remember mercy. So he's asking for revival. What is revival? Uh, one of the best definitions came from a man who was a missionary in Africa. And uh, you learn about these different great revivals. They had a great revival in Africa. In the early part of the 1900s, they had a great revival uh, under uh, George, uh, Ch Charles Finney here in America. Actually, two great awakenings in America. They had a great Wales revival in that country uh, during the 19th century. And so there are big, big revivals, not counting some that are less revivals that some of you may know about. So what is revival? Norman Grubb, who was in that revival in Africa, wrote a little book, and uh, it's called Continuous Revival, Continuous Revival. And what he's saying there, you can have revival personally. You don't have to wait for the church to have revival. You don't have to have a nation be revived. They may never get revived. Your church may not get revived, but you can get revived. And this is what a uh, little formula that they came up with in seeing personal revival. You can live, leave here today and have personal re revival in your life. He says this is the pattern that they saw during this revival. Number one, exposure of sin. There was light put through the Holy Spirit. We sung a song just now about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the convictor. Now, he doesn't condemn you, but he will convict you, right? To repentance and restoration, 
The Holy Spirit does not bring condemnation and guilt on you, but he will nudge you and speak to you about sin in your life. That's why he, one of the reasons that he was sent to convict of sin and to point people to Jesus Christ. Number one, exposure of sin, confession of sin, cleansing of sin, cups overflowing. Now that's the way to have personal revival. Confession, exposure of sin. He puts the light on something that he doesn't want in your life. Confession of that sin, asking God to cleanse you of that sin, and then the cups overflowing is the Holy Spirit overflowing in your life. Uh, D. Martin Lloyd-Jones has a book just simply called Revival. A revival, he says, is a mighty act of God, and it is a sovereign act of God. God has to bring it about. The spirit of revival. If you can explain, D. Martin Lloyd-Jones says, if you can explain what is happening apart from God, then it is not revival. It is something that God does to raise the spiritual level of a person or a church or a community or a nation. The Holy Spirit raises the level of awareness of the presence of God in that place. Right. Habakkuk gives us some elements of true revival. What's involved in revival? What kind of revival, really, he is telling us, do, does a church need, does a person need? He talks a revival of hearing God, a revival of fearing God. That means a reverential trust and respect for God, a reverence for God. So second was a revival of fearing God. And third, it was a revival of seeing God work. So first of all, the first element, a revival of hearing God. When a land, a country, is consumed by immoral lifestyles and sin, you're not going to be hearing a word from God. Do you remember this happened in 1 Samuel, the second chapter, the call of young Samuel to be the new priest in the temple. Hannah had brought him back to Eli to learn how to light the candles in the temple and all of a sudden here, young Samuel, young boy, is hearing, hearing a word from God as to what God's going to do. And what does it say in that text? And I want to read to you in 1 Samuel, the third chapter, verse 1. You can look it up. And I'm going to read out of the Message Bible, the Message Bible. There was a time when the revelation of God was rare, rarely heard are seen. The Living Bible says, Now in these days, messages from the Lord was very rare and visions were quite uncommon. The opposite of revival is backslidden condition, sinful condition. And during those times, the hearing a word from the Spirit of God is very rare. You know what was happening. Samuel was living in, in a day in which Eli's two sons, who were to take his place in the temple, were living a very, very immoral lifestyle. Uh, they didn't come to the temple area to lead in worship. They came to the temple area to sin. They were sinful in, in the way that they received the sacrifices. And they had an immoral lifestyle right inside of the temple area. And you know, these are the two sons of Eli that were eventually killed in battle because they took the Ark of the Covenant into battle with them. Remember that story? So the Bible says during this time, a word from God was rare. During these evil and sinful times, very, very few people were hearing anything from God. Question, when is the last time you have ever heard or listened to the still small voice of God? When's the last time you've heard from God? Yes, I believe he still speaks with that still small spirit. It may not be an audible voice, but you can hear from God through the Holy Spirit. But in this day, 
a word from God was rare. And this is the day of young Samuel. Eli's sons were living wicked lives. Habakkuk is reproved by God for his sin and for Judah's sin and for questioning God about what was going to happen through the Chaldeans. And he is given a word of how to hear God. Now, we're going to have to do the same, but we want to hear, hear from God. What's involved in hearing from God? Number one, there has to be silence. Paul says to Timothy, till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Meditate upon these things. Sit in silence and listen to what God. So first of all, in hearing God, there's silence. Take time to hear God speak to you through his word and through prayer, through the Holy Spirit. Number two, the second aspect of hearing is submission and obedience when God speaks to you. Habakkuk, be silent and wait for a word from God. James 4th, 4th chapter, verse 7. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. Be willing to when you hear God that you're so submissive to God, you will do exactly what he tells you to do. Once you get a word, be obedient to that word. So that's the second thing in hearing is being willing to obey God. In obedience, obedience is cooperation with God and obedience is confident in the word that you have got from God. He says, I have given it to you. I have given to you the word of God. Now he wants Habakkuk to do that. So when you get a word of God, here's the secret. When he tells you to do something, prompt obedience will bring revival in your life. Amen. Just do what he says. Amen. I'm listening before God, I'm reading the Word of God, and He nudges me to do something for His kingdom. Then if you want to experience revival, then there must be prompt obedience to the Word of God. So there needs to be a revival of hearing God. What is God saying? Learning how to hear from God. Number two, we need a revival of fearing God. A reverence for God, a reverential respect for God and His Word. Here are some verses about fearing God. Genesis 42. This do and live, for I fear God, Joseph. Psalm 34, 19. Fear the Lord, you His saints. Proverbs 3, 7. Fear God and depart from evil. Ecclesiastes 12, 13. Let us hear the conclusion of the matter. Let us hear the conclusion of the matter, what God wants us to do. Fear God and keep His commandments. And then He will guide in taking care of the needs of our lives. So, number two, there needs to be a revival of fearing the Lord. Now, this describes our land today. Jeremiah 3. Therefore the showers have been withheld, and there is no spring rain. Because you, Judah, have a harlot's forehead, and you refuse to be ashamed. Judah refused to repent and to ask forgiveness and to be ashamed at their sinful lifestyle. You know, you can say and almost do anything in America and get away with it. Not even talk about being ashamed. We don't see any real fear of God with people breaking God's command time and time and time again. Habakkuk says they have a harlot's forehead and they refuse to be ashamed. And he goes on to say, they don't know how to blush anymore. Why did they have this type of attitude? They thought that their sins would not find them out. Numbers 32, 23. Be sure your sin will find you out. 
The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the good and evil. Amen? Amen. God's eyes are everywhere, and He looks at the good things that nobody else knows that you're doing for the Lord. Praise God for that. Amen? Amen? People that are not even asking for praise for anything, doing a lot of good deeds. But also the evil deeds that maybe people like David was trying to hide his sin with Bathsheba. Nobody will discover this. And yet Nathan came to him and he put the word on Nathan. There needs to be a revival of fearing God. We don't have but a tiny bit of fear of God, if any, here in America. Concerning morals and ethics and truth, there's no fear of God. In Acts the 19th chapter, revival came to the city of Ephesus. And the Bible says this when revival comes, and fear, fear fell upon them all. And the name of the Lord was being magnified. And many of those who had used magic brought their books and they were burned. And it was well over $50,000 worth. Back then, $50,000 worth of magical books were burned. And there was revival in the city of Ephesus. Read Acts the 19th chapter. And one of those who led in revival in America was Jonathan Edwards, sinners in the hands of the, of the mighty God. You remember? Jonathan Edwards was the leader of the revival in New England, 1730 to 1745. This is what he said, brought the revival. He was convinced that he has no doubt at all, but that the sudden death of a person in the town of Northampton where the revival started the sudden death of a person in the town of Northampton was the factor that God used to spark revival. A calamity, a strange happening, something that alarms people, something that makes them realize the fleeting character of life in this world are the things that God uses to spark revival. What is God going to use to spark revival in America? Are we just going to explain it away when it happens? Or are we going to let it bring us back to closeness? Draw nigh to God and he says, I'll draw nigh to you. Are we going to let it bring us closer to God? So there is a hearing of God and then there is a fearing of God. And last of all, there is a revival of seeing the work of God. Habakkuk says there in verse 2, Habakkuk 3, 2, In the midst of years, make it known, Lord. Show yourself. Show us what you're doing. Make it known means to publicly expose, Lord, what you're doing. It was a searching work. It was a saving work. And last of all, it was a strengthening work. It was a saving work. God comes to save us from our sins and the penalty of our sins. Habakkuk 3.13, Thou goest forth for the salvation of thy people, for the salvation of thy anointing. Thou didst strike the head of the house of evil. And so God lets us know that he loves us and he wants to save us in revival. There are hundreds of thousands of people that get saved in true revival Hundreds of thousands of people get saved and are swept into the kingdom of God. New songs and new mu musicals are written in the midst of revival. New churches start up in the midst of revival. God is interested in saving us and not destroying us. Amen. That's why he allows these things to happen to get our attention that we might repent and seek him. And those that are lost will come to saving faith in Jesus Christ. And so, not only is it a searching work and a, a saving power of God, but it is a work that will strengthen us. In the last verse, now we preached about that last week, that last verse of Habakkuk 3. The Lord is my strength, and He will make my feet like hinds feet, deer's feet that can walk on the mountains, the rocky mountains. He will make me walk upon the high places. He'll give us the strength 
to go through these evil times. He'll give us the power to overcome darkness if we repent and turn to Him and seek His face and ask for forgiveness, humble ourselves, 2 Chronicles 14, 7. If we do that, then God's interested in, in bringing revival and that revival will bring salvation to sinners and it will bring strength, bring strength and hope to those that are saved. He'll give us the power to continue on when He brings revival. It's a strengthening work. Uh, there will be an atmosphere of evangelism. The reason we're not reaching a lot of people, there's no atmosphere. During the charismatic movement back in the late 60s and early 70s, revival uh, went through every denomination. They didn't know what to do with it, but hundreds of thousands of people were getting saved and, and brought into the kingdom and all kinds of churches that didn't have uh, didn't emphasize evangelism. Episcopalians and Presbyterians and Lutherans that may not have emphasized evangelism, people were being swept into the kingdom of God during that revival. It's a strengthening work. I found the words to the person who took David Livingston's place as I close. Dan Crawford they found his Bible there in Africa, in the Congo. At his death, someone spotted his New Testament. And these words were penned on the inside of Dan Crawford, the man who took David Livingston's place. How would you like to take David Livingston's place? Who could fill those shoes? Well, he tried, Dan Crawford. This is what he said. I cannot do it alone. The waves dash fast and high. The fog comes chill around and the, go the light goes out in the sky. But I know that we too shall win in the end, Jesus and I. Amen. But I know that we too shall win in the end, Jesus and I. Coward and wayward and weak, I change with the changing sky. Dan Crawford said, I change with the changing sky. Today so strong and brave, tomorrow too weak to fly. But he never gives up, so we too shall win, Jesus and I. Amen. Amen. When revival comes to us personally and as a church, He'll give an atmosphere of evangelism that will reach scores of people. They'll be open to the gospel and he will strengthen us. They were going through financial difficulty. The fig tree was not blossoming. There's no, uh, there's no herds in the stall and so forth and so on. It was a financial crisis and God was saying to Habakkuk, I'll give you strength. I won't take this away from you. You remember I preached last week on things may not change. It may not get better. Things may not get better. It may not. We had best look to the Lord and repent and ask for His grace and strength. He says, I'll strengthen you. I'll make your feet. I, I compared it to those mules in the Grand Canyon. Sure-footed. Don't touch the reins. Leave it to the mules. They know how to walk down and up to the Grand Canyon. He says, I'll make you stable, steadfast, during the most difficult times, if you look to me. This is what Dan Crawford was saying. I can't do this. And God enabled him to fulfill those shoes. I know that I need revival. How about you? And like Norman Grubb says, we can have revival every day if we choose to do so, a personal revival. If nobody else wants it, you can have it. I can have it. It is a revival of hearing God once again, a revival of a holy fear of God, where we respect His Word and are obedient to His Word, not just read it and hear it, but obey it. And a revival of once again seeing God work in our life. Wouldn't you like to hear God again? Wouldn't you like to see God work in our midst again? God wants it more than us. He's ready for revival. But we have to meet the conditions. Would you stand with your heads bowed and eyes closed? 
I can't do these things for you. You can't do them for me. But each one of us here today can have a personal revival. And God, through His Holy Spirit, does the convicting. He doesn't do condemning. He does convicting. That still small voice putting the finger on something says, I, won't, I don't want that in your life anymore. You need to do away with that. You don't need to be associated with that. He convicts by His Holy Spirit. And we can see a restoration, a revival in our personal life, if we so choose. Would you allow him to have his way? When he speaks to your heart, will you, are you willing second to heed? A revival of hearing God, a revival of fearing God, and that involves obedience. You don't really fear God until you start obeying him, what he tells you to do. Not enough just to know the word, Hear the word, read the word, we have to do the word. Be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. If you're willing to let God have his way in your life, and I'm speaking to myself too, he's willing to give us personal revival. Today we have learned how to have a revived life. But first of all, how do we have a regenerate life? If you would like to have a redeemed, regenerate life, then pray this prayer with me. Pray it right now. Dear God, I know that you love me because you sent your only begotten Son. I also know that I am a sinner. I have broken your commands. I have fallen way short of what you want me to be. I need a Savior. Dear Jesus, forgive me of my sins and be my Savior and Lord from this day forward and give me your Holy Spirit as a sign to me that you have accepted me. I ask you this in Jesus' name. Now, if you prayed a prayer like that and you really meant it, then I want you to call us and give us your name and number, and we're going to send you some information for new beginners. Call us today on the number that's on the screen, and we'll send you some helpful information. God bless you. See you Sunday at 11 a.m. I want to thank many of you for telling me that you're watching our program, Moment of Destiny. You have told me how much this program means to you week after week. But at this time, we need your help more than ever. For a love gift of $50, we're going to send you our prayer journal, Walking in Victory Journal. It has sections on how to do a quiet time, how to study the Bible. It has a section on basic Christianity, how to renew your mind every day and live the Christian life. It has a section on how to pray for other people. When you send your love gift to P.O. Box 15545, West Palm Beach, Florida, 33416, we will send you the Walking in Victory Journal.